Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbow, the Sage Parenting Coach, coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my three wildlings and the papa bear in our fixer-upper on the beach. This is episode 18, and today I'm here with my friend Tracy Gillette talking about judgment. Tracy is a nature-obsessed, adventure-loving mama of one and the founder of Raised Good, a blog and community that strives to support and empower parents to trust and follow their instincts on a natural parenting path, and the author of The Lost Art of Natural Parenting. So join us around the campfire, and let's get living the family life of our dreams. to our new patron, Carolina Kvass. As Sky likes to say, thanks for being awesome. If you are loving the Sage Family Podcast, you can become a part of it too through Patreon, where you can support these important conversations, help make this show great, and get rewards doing it. So many of you have picked up your copy of the Sage Homeschooling book, and I get messages and emails from mamas all over the world telling me how it has just changed their whole lives for the better. Receiving those messages is tremendously rewarding, and I also want to ask you a favor. Could you all post those kind words as a review on Amazon? The Sage Homeschooling book has 31 five-star reviews so far, and every single one makes a real difference in helping other parents who might be feeling overwhelmed or lost to find this resource. Sometimes choosing the adventure of the week is just painful. (laughs) We visited a pioneer farm with our friends that was such hands-on fun. The kids had a blast doing pioneer housework, farming, blacksmithing, and Bay took to the tyranny of the pioneer school teacher role with satirical vengeance. We had an adventure with a big group of our friends in which we built small wooden boats and rowed around Lake Union in an umiak, which is a handmade wood-framed canoe from the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest. But I'm actually going to talk about Skye's birthday trip today. My firstborn turned 13. We drove a few scenic hours, stopping whenever inspiration struck, like swimming at Lake Easton, to the adorable little Bavarian mountain town of Leavenworth. We met up with friends at the KOA and swam together in the river at sunset. After we crashed their campsite, they crashed our hotel pool for hours more splashy fun until closing. The next day we swam in gorgeous Lake Wenatchee and then went on a horseback riding trail through the woods. Skye added horseback riding to her experience list during our seasonal collaboration session with the bucket system, so it was perfect for her birthday adventure. The experience for us all was wonderful. I actually used to have a horse. I rode every other day, I took lessons, I went to horseback riding camp, I won grand champion. Unfortunately, I'm also severely allergic to horses, so sharing this with my kids was extra special and a little bittersweet. On the way home, we climbed all over the boulders of Eagle Falls and made it back as a family of a teenager. If you want to see photos and videos of these adventures, then head on over to Sage Parenting on Instagram and follow along. Today, my friend Tracy is joining me to share a conversation on something that I'm willing to bet all of you have struggled with at one time or another, judgment. I first discovered Tracy when her beautiful memes began floating down my social media feed. (laughs) So I began following her online and then I was interviewed on the Attachment Parenting Podcast where you had done an interview and the host Megan McHugh said that I absolutely must reach out and connect with you. So I sent you over a DM on Instagram just to say I loved your work 
and you said, I love your work too. And then I got to read your book, The Lost Art of Natural Parenting, which is amazing. And everyone should go out and read it. Um, and then I invited her here. And now we have plans to respectfully stalk Brooke Hampton of Barefoot Five together if she ever comes to the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> where we both live. <laughs> So long story long, I'm a big fan of her quality work and of her as a human being, and I'm sure you will be too by the end of this episode. Now tell us your story, Tracy. Who are you? What are you passionate about? What about your relationships and life fulfill you? And what is your relationship with this topic of judgment? Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you for such a kind introduction. <laughs> um, that was lovely, and it's so nice for us to connect as well. Um so who am I? I'm Tracy, and I'm originally from Australia, but I now live up the road from you Woo-hoo! in Vancouver, BC. Um, we moved to Canada about seven years ago now, so got Canadian citizenship and slowly collect- collecting passports as we travel around the world. <laughs> um, I'm married to a Kiwi, and um, we've lived in the UK together, we've traveled around Europe and had lots of fun doing that. Um, in a previous life, I was a veterinarian, um, so I worked in practice um, for about 10 years, um, mostly with cats and dogs, and absolutely loved that, but um, have switched course, and we're now living in Canada, and we welcomed our son into the world five years ago, so we've got one little guy, and he's just amazing, just the light of my life, and mm. when he was born... Well, before he was born, I, I we had some struggles with fertility, and so I learned a lot about natural fertility. And then when I got pregnant, I started to learn about natural parenting, and I just loved everything that I was learning, and I wanted to share it with the world. So um, I became passionate about, um, yeah, about all things natural and evolutionary and the biological way that we're, you know, sort of designed to parent. And I started my blog, um probably about four years ago, I think, was probably the first version of it. And I discovered that I had a passion for writing, which was pretty unexpected for me because I'd always been down the science path. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, so that's a new passion. And then um, what I'm passionate about in in my life is traveling and adventuring and seeing new places, um, photography, getting outside, and merging that with my relationships with my son and, and my husband. And my relationship with this topic, I think all of us face judgment throughout our lives, but especially at the moment being a parent when so many of our decisions and choices are fairly public, um, yeah, it becomes something that we either need to defend or to be able to just um, stand pr- stand proudly for. And I don't know why, but I've always been someone who was quite happy to do that. So I found myself in a position where I try to be an example and try to stand up for other women and other parents too, who maybe may not feel as strong to do that and yeah, create community. Yeah, pump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, I think that's me. That was a fantastic intro. Um, I love everything about your story. And even, you know, it's funny because for a lot of us, we may have started out in one field or in one on one career path. And then after having children, we really pivoted. And isn't it wonderful how certain pieces or things from those experiences and that knowledge pool carry over onto this path that we're on now because throughout your book I know that there's a lot of I mean when you talk about the research and when you talk about the science and when you talk about your experience with animals like it really adds to the perspective that you bring now yeah yeah big time big time and I you know whenever I tell people that they say oh what do you do and I say oh, well now I'm in marketing I, I have a I have a an, an office job and I and I do marketing but I used to be a vet and I, oh it's such a shame that you gave that up all that education all that you know <laughs> oh, that what, what a shame and, um, Ooh, and I think it, what it's, a, it shame. Is a shame <laughs> that is a shame but it's it's more of a shame to continue to spend your life doing something that you're not happy with <laughs> um, right but um 
yeah, but it's it's not a shame because it leads you to where you are. You know, I met my husband at university, and um, you know, I made some great friends there, and it um, t- and it taught me how to um, translate science to lay people. You know, when I when I was in consults with people and explaining to them what was wrong with their animals, and and I've found that to be very useful now when I look at you know peer reviewed journal articles that you know that the standard most people you know, don't, don't have time to read or, or, or can't necessarily understand right. everything that's in there and just translating that to something that's actually, you know, that, that, that can just be understood um, easily. So, yeah, I find that, that really helpful. But, um, yeah, my first, my first love and my first passion and, and, and always will be are animals and wanting to stand up for animals and wanting to stand up for those who can't speak for themselves. And, um, you know, I became vegetarian when I was 13, much to the disgust of my grandfather, who was a farmer (laughs) and owned three butcher shops. Um, But... um, (laughs) You know, and and then it, suddenly I realised when I became a mother. Well, now there's another minority that I wasn't aware of: babies yeah. and children, and they can't speak for themselves. They can't say what they need and what they want, and and so many of us adults assume that we know what they need and what they want, or or probably more accurately, what we need them to want. Um, so yeah, so that it, it just translated to wanting to stand up for these little people that just we're so lucky to share our lives with. Oh, I can relate to that so powerfully. And I feel like just you and I could just chat about yeah. <laughs> life for like a solid two hours first before we even I'm really sure. get into judgment. So. I'm sure. <laughs> but I want us to start off by getting to know judgment a little better because she is not your enemy and you cannot kick her out of the party. So I want to invite you to see her in a new light and change your relationship with her. I talk about the natural and important role of judgment in the Sage Parenting book, and you shared the same sentiments in your Lost Art of Natural Parenting book. So, how does judgment serve us? Right. So, yeah, absolutely. We we can't run away from judgment. It's it's there. I I when I wrote my book, and um, in a blog post that I wrote about the topic. Um, I found a survey that found that 87% of mums judge each other. It's it's just the way it is. And um, the truth is that, so we all judge um, and we're wired for moral judgment. It's normal and it's a natural thing to do. And part of our brain, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, it's dedicated to that emotional aspect of moral judgment. So it's unavoidable for us as humans to not do it. Um, it's a survival mechanism. It can help us make sense of the world around us. And judgment itself, I think, can be healthy. It can help us evaluate our observations against our own personal belief systems and help us in making decisions um, about what's important for us and our family and create authenticity and shape us. But I think the real problem with judgment is when it becomes toxic and when it's made through a lens of ignorance and without any empathy. Um, So I think it's important to judge decisions or to evaluate decisions or choices or parenting practices but never to judge the person who's making that decision um, Mm. because you don't know anything about their life and you know I can make certain choices because of where my life is right now if I'd had my son 10 years ago and I was in a different situation maybe some of the choices I would be making would be different yeah so I think it's really important to separate the person that's making that that decision um, from the practice itself. Um, you know, something like cry it out or sleep training is, you know, is, is a classic. Um, not judging the parent who does it because they're desperate and because the doctor has told them that it's safe. Yeah, and because they but, don't know there's another way. Yeah, but judging, you know, and, and showing empathy to that mum who is just so sleep deprived and thinks that she's doing the right thing and thinks that she needs to teach her baby how to sleep because that's what she's been told and that's the information that she's got. So the antidote to that is making sure that the best knowledge is available, that the real information is available, that there is support for that mother, um, you know, that that she can get a village around her, that she can understand that there are other choices. So, yeah, I think it's it's not so much judgment that's a problem, but I think it's that our society is just really lacking empathy and Mm. we're lacking lacking connection and and yeah I think that's probably for me that's the real issue yeah that's an important distinction 
A judgment is a considered opinion or sensible conclusion. So we are judging the world around us and the people in it all the time in that through that lens, in that context. Judgment helps us sort out where and how we belong. It highlights our feelings, perspectives, and values. For example, if I see someone throw their garbage on the ground, judgment stands up and says, hey, that doesn't feel right. We're going to make a different choice for ourselves. Is there anything more we can do? And judgment works the other way too. Before I had children, a college classmate gave a presentation with photos of her full-term breastfeeding in public all around the world and judgment whispered so loudly in my ear hey hey there is so much here that i'm loving lean into this and learn more about it so i mean that's judgment too just in that positive direction so if you've ever made a choice about something you have judged you're a judger (laughs) i was deciding between two bags of mixed seeds the other day and i judged the heck out of those seeds and invited the one i judged to be superior (laughs) to come back to my place so let's just dial down the outrage at the word judgment because it is natural and it does serve us so the question becomes then just how do we have a healthy relationship with it which I know you mentioned, like differentiating between judging the choice and judging the person. What might it look like when we're struggling in our relationships with judgment? When and how is judgment a problem? Okay, so I think it really starts to become a problem when we start to change our behavior. Um, Mm. So um, if we start to avoid other people or feel nervous about making our choices public um, or lying about what we're doing, so... Bed sharing is a famous example, at least in my world, Um, for being something that um, at least half of parents lie about doing for fear of judgment. And I completely understand um, why people do that. But when we do that, it gives the impression that mainstream is more mainstream than it is. So the more that, um, that we as a minority can stand proud and say what we're doing, then the more that alternative choices start to become normalized. So um, I think it's, yeah, it it becomes a problem when we're, when we're so fearful of it, that, that it starts to change our behavior. And I think often that the fear of judgment is worse than judgment itself. Mm. So I was funny example. I was um, in a gondola um, going up the side of a mountain um, a week ago and in a, in this enclosed space with, you know, four other people and the lady opposite me, um, she said, oh, so starting um, starting school next week? And I said, no, actually, we're homeschooling. I, we're so excited and um, we've got a little community school over on Bowen Island that we're going to go to for two hours a week for an art class and that teacher will support us with homeschooling and just so amazing. And and she said, oh, yeah, you know, look, look at, you know, what we've got around us. It's so beautiful. There's so much to do and see. And, and I said, yeah, absolutely. And then she said, well, but I've got to go back to school next week. And I said, oh, are you a teacher? And she said, no, I'm a principal at the local school down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed. And I said, well, if you told me that at the start of the conversation, I wonder if I would have been so bold. Um, and I think... That's often, you know, if I had known, I maybe I would have danced around the point or maybe I would have seemed not so confident in my choice yeah. and then maybe that would have given her an inroad to try to probe me on it and, and try to open up a crack where I'm not so confident. Yeah. Um, but really just being, you know, being positive and, and enthusiastic and, and fully bought into your choice, I think, can, mm. can make a big difference. Um I think judgment is also a problem when it starts to really impact our happiness and our relationships with those we love. And, um, and one of the people that I love following on this topic is Brené Brown. Mm. And, um, I wrote down a a quote of hers that I'd love to just, yes, please do. There's always space for Brené Brown on this podcast (laughs) for her words. She's, She's amazing. Um, so she, she talks about fitting in as being the opposite of belonging. So she says, um, fitting in is the greatest barrier to belonging. Fitting in, I've discovered during the past decade of research, is assessing situations and groups of people 
then twisting yourself into a human pretzel in order to get them to let you hang out with them. Mm. Belonging is something else entirely. It's showing up and letting yourself be seen and known as you really are. Many of us suffer from the split between who we are and who we present to the world in order to be accepted, but we're not letting ourselves be known. And this kind of incongruent living is soul sucking. Mm. So I just love that. I think it, it is soul sucking. You're either yes. you're cheat, cheating yourself when, when you're um, letting judgment get the better of you. And um, I think it's really important to realize that we're the change makers, yeah. you know, particularly in, you know, as far as, um, you know, different choices like homeschooling or, or, you know, long full-term breastfeeding or um, co-sleeping or things like that. And there are people that have gone before us to already make the path easier for us. And we need to honor that and honor the sacrifices that, that they made and realize that we're doing the exact same thing, you know, for, for our Mm. kids so that they can parent our grandchildren. Um, and in ways that that are authentic to them and be able to make choices so yes. yeah i think it's just important to realize it's hard like it's hard and it sucks and there's no getting around it but that doesn't mean that we run away yes yes a carrying around everyone else's expectations in your baggage is like <laughs> where judgment really can take you down things like good babies sleep through the night your homeschooling what about socialization it's like this spiral yeah. of negative self-talk and getting knocked off balance by comments and an inability to hold boundaries for your family you can kind of spiral down so judgment becomes a problem when we cannot tolerate sitting with it We have to be able to have that conversation when we feel the trigger or when we get hooked. I feel you, I hear you, then speak to it. Let me look into that. If you need to do some research to get to a place where you feel good about standing in your truth or actually I've done my homework on this one and I'm fully in line with my values and I'm great right here or wow, I am out of step with my path right now on this issue. Let me course correct. It's like a compass check. So when you feel judgment, like when you feel yourself get hooked by not even judgment necessarily, but fear of judgment or anxiety about potential judgment, like you said, can you sit with it and have a conversation within yourself in order to speak to it? And then discomfort is an invitation for growth. So lean in when you feel it. Whenever judgment has stood up in my life, it has always led to growth. Either I have confronted a previously held belief with my eyes wide open and allowed myself to be moved by new information or experience. Like when we know better, we do better, right? Embrace that cognitive dissonance. Or I have grown in my clarity, confidence, articulation, and strengths. So either direction, if I'm feeling that trigger, I want to sit with that feeling and I want to speak to it and allow myself to either grow in the strength and clarity of the position that I'm in or be moved by new information and experience. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And I, one of the, one of the things that you mentioned, um, about discomfort, there was a, an amazing Ted talk. I, I, I watched it a few months ago. Um, I think it's relatively new by Susan David and the, um, the the topic was that discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. Mm. And I think that's so true. We just run away from discomfort um, in all aspects of our life. Um, you know, we, we get a headache, we grab for a, for an ibuprofen. We, um, you know, we, we feel judgment. We want to run away from it. Yes. We have a baby that's keeping us up through the night. The baby needs to sleep. No, you need to be, just yes. what's the worst that can happen? Just sit with it and just be with it. And this, it's it's worthwhile. It's monumentally worthwhile to go through that because you're making your family sacred in doing that. And yeah, it's it's hard, but it's um it's so worth it. Yeah, or like even I'm feeling discomfort in my relationship with my child, so I need more t- alone time and more date nights and more time away as opposed to yeah. leaning into that discomfort and sitting with that feeling and working through it and finding a path through it. Um, yeah, emotional absolutely. agility. Yeah. Which is, I believe by the same author who did that Ted talk is a book that yes. is fantastic. So if you want to, um, 
learn more about that whole sitting with your feelings thing. (laughs) That is a book I definitely recommend. She's fantastic. Yeah, her TED Talk is awesome. (laughs) And I've heard her on some podcasts and yeah. Yeah, she's she's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, we try to teach our kids, you know, that um, we try to teach our kids emotional regulation and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that not to run away from from feelings like anger or sadness or disappointment exactly. or jealousy you know and and so we're just kind of teaching ourselves as well you know mm-hmm. i i i had down that um you know judgment where we talk about it relating to adults we call it judgment but when we when kids are talking about it it's probably peer pressure <laughs> and we we wouldn't want our kids to succumb to peer pressure. So, right. Um, yeah, we would. So I think we've got to parent ourselves a bit because maybe we weren't given, maybe it wasn't modelled to us as well as it possibly could be. And that's nothing against our own parents. They did the best that they could at the time. But yeah, yeah. We, I it's, keep finding it's that to change that. I keep finding that so much of so much more of parenting is about parenting myself than parenting my oh, kids than I ever realized. Yeah. Yeah. at the start of this journey yeah. I thought it was gonna yeah. be about them but no but by far the vast majority of the work that I have had to do in order to become the best parent that I can be at this point in my life has been parenting myself <laughs> mm. yeah big time I often say like no amount of therapy <laughs> compares to what it's my son has, has uncovered <laughs> yeah well, once yeah. you have shifted your relationship with judgment, you are free from fear of judgment to stand tall in your light. I'm talking about living openly and honestly as your authentic selves. This is the space where you can fully accept your children for exactly who they are, love yourself with grace, and walk your path with peace and dignity. Why do you think it's important to live with authenticity? Oh, that's a, that's such a big question. <laughs> I actually feel a bit speechless by it because it's just it's so important. Like I, yeah, I I have almost no tolerance for small talk and <laughs> for like just rubbish conversations. I just and um, yeah, I I literally I I can't I can't smile. I can't do a fake smile. No like smiling my hard. Hus- yeah, my husband will often be in a situation. My husband's like, "Just do it." I'm like, I, "I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> like, I'm really trying." He's like, There's, "You're not trying." My body physically just, won't do it. You know, most yeah. most people in the U.S. It's funny they have this like smile and nod thing where if somebody says something that you really, you know, like, "Oh, does your baby sleep through the night?" and they just sort of smile and nod. Which again, I'm mm-hmm. not judging any people for doing. But one of the first things we learn as therapists is that smiling and nodding is an affirmation. It's agreement and it's an invitation to say more. <laughs> so you're yeah, inviting yeah. more of their yeah. quote unquote expertise to be delivered yeah. upon you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, yeah. So I, I, it's, you know, it goes both ways. It's a bit of a double edged sword. Sometimes I wish I could be a bit more inauthentic because, <laughs> because, because life sometimes just requires it. But um, yeah, I just, I think it's just like you have to be your true self. I, and I, I put down a, a few other reasons why I think it's so important. And I think that probably the biggest one is connection. And um, we all crave connection. That's probably uh, the, the thing that drives us most is, is connection. And when we don't have it, then we start to look for it in our phones or in social media. Or we try to, you know, drown out our need for it in, in coffee or alcohol or TV or whatever yeah. it is. And But nothing can replace that human connection. And I think it's so hard to connect with someone who isn't authentic. Um, I tried to think of an example of, of how it sort of physically looks. And I was imagining sort of trying to, to rock climb a wall. And, and if that wall was smooth as glass, you can't climb it. There's nothing to connect to. There's nothing to grab onto. Mm. But that authentic person who is willing to let all their imperfections be seen. You've got something to grab onto. You've got something to connect with and something to laugh with. And, yes. you know, and I think that that is just so important to, to, to be able to have connection. You have to be authentic. Um, you know, I've got, got people in my life. Um, all of us do, um, you know, who, who aren't as, as authentic as they could be. And they'll smile and nod and agree with me, 
but it's harder for me to connect with them than it is to connect with someone who's completely authentic, but with who I disagree on so many different things. Right. I would much rather, I could, I could have a much better relationship with someone who I disagree with, but who's authentic. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think, I think connection and relationship is, is so important for, for authenticity. Um, I think also just our world needs it. We've, we've got so many problems, <laughs> we've got, got um, you know, issues that, that really need people who are authentic and who are willing to ask the tough questions and ask the right questions. Um, I think so often we don't go deep enough um, with questions, you know, at, at the moment, or a couple of weeks ago, I guess, social media was full of articles like, you know, how to help your kids' anxiety and going back to school. I was like, mm. really? Is that the real question? Or is the question, <laughs> why are we putting our kids in an anxiety-inducing situation in the first place? What's the benefit of this? Why? why yeah. Like, and I think it takes authentic people, people's, people whose souls are set on fire with, you know, just passion and, um, and courage and vulnerability and, and all these things that only come with authenticity who are going to be willing to ask those questions and make changes that – that our world really needs. Yes. Um, and we touched on it before when we're not authentic, we start to lie about our choices because we try to fit in, mm. which as Brene Brown says, you know, is the opposite of belonging. Yes. Um, and that's where you pick then, up the shame piece. Yeah. You pick up the shame piece. Yeah. Big time. And shame is just so toxic, isn't it? Yep. And that's another thing that Brene talks about is that parenting is the shame minefield. And that when you start to tell people what your choices are, if they're different to your to what theirs were, particularly, you know, grandparents and people like that, it's a shame minefield. And then they start to feel shame for, did they do the right thing? Mm -hmm. did, did they make the wrong choice? And that's when empathy comes in and just having open conversations. And, you know, I'm one of four kids and we're all formula fed. Um, and, you know, we're, we're born in, in the late, well, I was late 70s, um, early 80s for the rest of my, my siblings. That was the done thing. Yeah. I wish that my mum would have breastfed me. Now that I know all of the amazing, you know, um, health benefits and and that that we could have got from it, but I don't judge her for it because that that was the done thing. And if she'd known better, she might have done better. Mm -hmm. But that's just the way it was. Um, so yeah, not having shame for things. You can't go back and change what's done, but you can certainly try to repair it and move forward. Um, you know, if some decisions weren't, weren't the best. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, but if you're living authentically, then, then you're much more likely to, to make choices that are in line with your personal beliefs. And even if they're wrong, like, I'll definitely be making a ton of mistakes right now. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to mess my son up, but I will in some way, for sure. For sure. Uh, at least I'll be able to say, well, I really tried. I really <laughs> tried my best. And I didn't just do what somebody else said or followed what somebody else said just because they were doing it yeah. um, or just because somebody else told me to. Um, and I think that's another important thing is that when people are judging us, I had one homeschooling mum say this to me, um, said that um, often people think that we've put in the same amount of thought and effort and investigation into our decisions as what they put into theirs which is probably almost none because, you know, like if you're just following the norm, right. the choice hasn't been should they go to school, it's just which school should they go yeah. to. Um, so if you're making the choice about whether or not they should go to school, you've put in a lot of research. You've read a, you've read a handful of books. You've listened mm -hmm. to podcasts. You've watched documentaries. You've Reached read out articles, to mentors. Yeah, all those sorts of things. Whereas someone who's just sent their kid to school, I don't know, how much thought, not that much. Yeah. Not judging that, but at the same time, don't try to judge. Don't think that I've made my choice in in ignorance, right? Because um, I certainly haven't. So, yeah, yeah. I think living with authentic authenticity is actually the thing I do that I believe makes the biggest and most profound impact on the world. I just live my truth out loud for the world to see, and I think of it like planting seeds. Gandhi said to be the change you want to see in the world and when you focus your energy on doing that openly you're planting seeds everywhere you go and that reminds me of what you said about 
you know, all these people coming before us, like blazing these trails and, and, um, clearing a way for us. And then it's sort of being our responsibility to do the same for the people who come behind, who come after us. Um, that's what I kind of visualize as that's like my why really for living with auth- with authenticity living openly and even when you factor in like all of my work my books and my coaching and my podcast like really the the most profound impact even within those contexts is just being very open and authentic in the way that I'm li- choosing to live with my kids. So one time I was in the middle of a busy family clothing store with my three kids and I was helping my older two by the dressing room while my youngest was running in circles around us and he fell and hit a table on the way down. And I put my hands on the shoulders of Sky and Bay for a quick moment and they both nodded and then I calmly sat down on the floor and gently scooped West into my lap And I held him and loved on him for a while until he was quiet enough to hear me. And I just said, you hit that table on the way down when you fell and it really hurt. And he said, yeah, right here and presented it to me to look at and care (laughs) for. And as I did, I said, oh, that looks like it hurt. Would you like a Band-Aid? And he said no and hugged me for a minute and then jumped up and showed his siblings who kissed it for him. And then as we continued walking toward the dressing room, this employee tapped me on the shoulder. And of course, I put my assertive face on, like, ready to <laughs> hold any boundaries for my family if they were going to quote unquote judge me for letting my kid run around in circles. Mm. But I see tears in her eyes and she says, I'm a mom of five and I just wanted to tell you that that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Sometimes I struggle and I just didn't know that it could be like that. Yeah. So, Like when I do the internal work of walking the gentle parenting path, even and especially in the settings that could garner the most judgment, I feel like it is that it always has the potential to do the most good. And then, of course, we're sending that consistent message to our kids that this is who we are and how we love unconditionally so when you plant those seeds around you sometimes they pop up quickly um sometimes they burrow slow deep roots and break through years later sometimes they never take and that's all okay i release my attachment to the outcome which i can't control and i just focus on investing my energy into my family in the present which i can control so i just try to be the best parent I can be and follow my values and my ideals in an authentic and open way. And that feels really powerful to me. Yeah, that, that's, that's a beautiful story. It's, um, yeah, I love that. And it, it um, reminded me of um, a sort of a similar story where in um, Whole Foods when my son was like 18 months. <laughs> and so he just started, you know, he could he could walk and he was sort of kind of running and doing his own thing and my husband was away at the time and I just I was in there and I just needed to get like five things and they have at the front of the store you know the little like art table with um all these exciting yeah. things for little toddlers to want to go and get yeah. so all he wanted to do was go to that table and I just needed to get these five things that were scattered throughout the store (laughs) and so I was getting this thing and he had just it was one of those half aisles and he had just gone just around the other side and I knew where he was and I was just grabbing what I needed and one of the store people came up to me and she said you know your son is around the other side like you gotta go and watch him (laughs) and I just like broke down I just said I'm on day 12 my husband is away I have no support all I need to do is go and get a sweet potato down there, a thing of yogurt down there. All he wants to do is go and play at that table. I just, um, I, I need help. And she, and she just, and then she was just like, put a hand on my shoulder and she was like, I will help you. I will watch Aww. your son and follow you around the store and help you get these things. And she just helped me. And that just, you just assume that people are going to have judgment and and that you should just respond and say oh I'm terribly sorry and I should really just make sure that and but sometimes if you just let them see your authentic self and let them see that you're vulnerable and you're just trying your best and you know what's going on then then sometimes they help and they see you and and then they connect with you and yeah I think I think that's where authenticity can really shine 
Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Like when we've been moving... Well, okay. So throughout this conversation, we've been moving outward. And now I want to talk about the external response. So let's get specific here. How sh- should we respond to judgment from others? Mm, that's, yeah, it's a tough one, I think. Um, right, so where should we start? I know that you're sarcastic, cause, like I am. So You have to give us the one answer that's perfect in all scenarios and with all people, right. please. Yeah, yeah, okay. The magic bullet. <laughs> yes. <Yep. laughs> um, okay, so I've got, a, I've got a few ideas here. <laughs> um, so depends on who the person is. Depends if you're ever going to see them again, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. um, if they're a perfect stranger, then firstly, just don't worry about it. Um, you know, don't worry about where it goes. I, I'm, I've joined this new homeschooling group, and there was a question that went around in the, um, um, in this email group last night, um, actually about judgment from one of the mums who had been being judged for her choices, and unfortunately, it was at a dinner party, and I think, sort of eight people. Mm. Um, sort of attacked her simultaneously um and one of the things that she said was I wish I'd had a witty comeback you know I Mm. wish I'd had like the thing to say yeah and one of the responses from one of the homeschoolers who'd been you know doing it for 10 years was just like you know it's not forget about the witty comeback like you're in a dark cave at that moment just get through it and one of the things that I try to remember is that it's not our job to try to convince others. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're not like trying to convert people yes. <laughs> to doing what we're doing. We're trying to support people who are already on this path or who are a little bit scared to, to come to, to go on that path. But it's not up to us to convert everybody to, to seek approval from everybody to convince the lady at Safeway that we're doing the right thing. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, that's that's not important so I think if it's a if it's a stranger um I'm just very enthused I am overly enthusiastic overly um positive about what we're doing um no matter what the choice is and um yeah and I just let my son be the example of you know he's he's so happy he's excessively happy he's excessively empathetic he is just he you know, he attracts people to him and, and, you know, maybe that would just be his personality anyway, if, you know, no matter what we've done, but I'm convinced that, that a lot of it is because of this gentle path that we've taken. So, um, yeah, letting your kids be the example of, of why you're doing what you're doing. I think when it, I think probably one of the hardest things is, is when it comes to family who are important and who are going to be in your in your kid's life for a long time obviously um you know like grandparents and I certainly found it easier with some things like even breastfeeding and um co-sleeping and things like that that was sort of somewhat private I guess you know we certainly talk about them but they happen in our own homes but you know, as soon as you start doing something like homeschooling, it becomes pretty obvious when <laughs> <laughs> you didn't just forget to not send them to school on <laughs> September 1st or February 1st, no matter wherever you are. Um, so, yeah, it becomes something that that needs to become a discussion. And, you know, I've been really pleasantly surprised by um, the support that we've that we've got from from our families for it. Um, certainly get choices um, questions about it. Um, so I think just sitting down with family and explaining the choices, giving them um, some things to read. They're probably not going to read books. Um, so reading, you know, some good articles or sending them to a TED talk, you know, so Ken yeah. Robinson <laughs> for, mm-hmm. for anything education related um, and and trying to get them them on board uh, for your decision, but then also realizing that, you don't need their approval for, for your decision yeah. um, and letting them know that too. Like we're going to go ahead with with what we believe is correct. Yeah. Um, I guess being open to some of their concerns and, you know, that may highlight something that, that you might even want to change if you hadn't thought about it. Um, but then letting them know, like, you need to respect our choices. You had a chance to be a parent and now it's my turn and we're making the decisions that are right for our family. We discovered that our son last year was is a highly sensitive person, mm-hmm. so it affects twenty percent of the population, um, and we've learned a lot about it. And 
for us, it, it really does make sense um, that he doesn't go into mainstream schooling. So I think explaining as well, for our family or for this child, this is what makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that's sort of how I deal with family. How, how do you deal with family? Oh, my gosh. Like, <laughs> all, all, all the things that you said. I think, like, when you're facing judgment in, in real time, like, one, you can ignore. Like, you do always have that choice to just kind of do this, the – well, I, a lot of people smile and nod. I would say if you're using the ignore strategy, intentionally don't smile and nod because that tends to shut down whatever they're giving you really quickly, um, but, mm-hmm. in, but in a like non-aggressive way. <laughs> so if you can just, you know, if you're in conversation making eye contact, just don't smile and nod and then the people will move on really quickly. Um, speak, yep. speak to their question, comment, or concern out loud this time with factual non-defensiveness. So this is, tends to work really well for people that you just come across in everyday life. Um, for example, how long are you going to breastfeed until we're ready to be done? So like, think like, how can you answer this question in one sentence? And it can be helpful to have some responses prepared ahead of time for frequently offered judgment. So if you find that you're hearing the same thing over and over and over, um, like getting the same question, just think about how to answer it every time the same way in one sentence. And then to sit down at another time and have a conversation to establish a boundary. This is the one that answers your question of what do you say to like family members? Because this is best for permanent people in your life. So not in the heat of the moment when you're fighting about your choice to school or not school your kid, um, but at another time to actually sit down with them and have a conversation and say, We really value your wisdom and your experience, so we have carefully considered it, and we've gotten to know this individual child really well, and we've done our own research um, to see what new information is out there, and this is what we have decided to do. So you don't have to agree with it, but you do have to respect it, and then be specific about what that looks like and what it doesn't look like. So just what you said earlier, basically. Um, I've actually found that being content and happy is the best recipe for staving off judgment, which I think you mentioned yeah, earlier. I agree. Smiles are contagious. Like none of my extended family, gentle parents, or homeschools, but they see that we feel really good about our intentional choices. So even when your kids are having the hardest time out in public, if you are okay, Others feel that, as does your kid, right? Those mirror neurons and being that emotional anchor. So I accept my kid for exactly who they are today and how they are in this moment. If you hold that acceptance in your heart, others will too. Like we're combating childism here. So what can I do in this moment to nurture our connection and hold the space for their experiential learning? So to feel their feelings, to be themselves, to make their choices and ensure that we're respecting ourselves, others and the environment, which are our three agreements. So the judgment of others is not a threat to me. Um, I think that's really important to like for most of us, that is the case. So to remind yourself of that, like that's what defensiveness is. It's your fight, flight, or freeze. Mama bear, cave woman standing up and taking over in a cascade of cortisol and adrenaline, also sometimes called anxiety, which just like judgment has a really good and natural place in our lives. Thank you, amygdala, for keeping us safe from predators. (laughs) But when you make really informed choices and are really connected with your child, You don't need the approval of others, which I know you mentioned. Like those societal expectations aren't defining your parenting script. You've written your own. Judgment. Big time. Yeah, judgment is like someone saying, hey, those aren't the right lines. And you can simply say, oh, I'm not using that script. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's one of the biggest things I get. you know, especially if I write about sleep. So sleep, <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's just so bizarre to me that sleep is such a controversial topic, you know. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I get told I'm mum shaming. Yes. Oh, you're mum shaming because you're saying that, um, you know, that non-responsive sleep training isn't a good idea. Like, I'm, I'm not mum shaming. That's a fact. Like, that's yeah. a fact. Do with it what you want, but be – and I think that's the thing. Like, I'm informed in my choices – and 
And so nobody can shame me for them. Yes. Because I 100% believe in what I'm doing. Yep. So nobody can really shame you. That that comes from... Within. That, that's within. Yep. Yeah. Um, what somebody else says might trigger that, but mm-hmm. they're not doing it to you. Yes. <laughs> and... And I think, you know, it comes back to this whole like victim mentality and yes. and just take responsibility for your own life. Yes, and, for your own choices. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's so often when others lash out at us because they see what we're doing and they yeah. go, hey, maybe I'm not 100% sure on what I'm doing. So, but it's easier just to tell her that what she's doing is crazy. Yes. <laughs> I'm doing what everyone else is doing, even though it doesn't feel right. Um, At least once a day, especially when talking about things like breastfeeding, I would get a comment somewhere on something about accusing me of mom shaming. Basically, anytime I state a fact or mm. share my experience. So either of those two things will elicit at least one comment is guaranteed about stop shaming moms. But if we stop disseminating evidence-based information out of fear of offending people... We are doing an incredible disservice to this whole generation of, of families because we need this information. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they need that information, and you know, and it can and it can change. You know, the emails that I get from people saying that you know just reading this one thing has changed the trajectory of their parenting. Yeah, I'm like that is amazing. That makes it worth it. Yeah. I don't really care what anybody else thinks. Yeah. I don't know where I got this from. My dad is certainly down this path. Like I remember, you know, going to school and being nervous about something and just like, what do you care? Like, are they going to hurt you? Like, yeah. physically hurt you? Or, it doesn't matter. Like, are you ever yes. going to see them again? And just, yeah, not worrying about what other people think. I, I haven't shared this story very well. I probably shared this story at, at all. Um, my uncle um, was gay and he had AIDS and this was in the early 90s and I visited him. I was 15, 16 at the time and visited him in the hospital, you know, over and all, all the time and and eventually he died and he was 36 when he died and especially every day since being 36, you know, I, I think about him mm. and when I was in... So it was my final year at school and I wrote about this experience of of getting the phone call that, that he'd passed away and um, everything that, that it had meant to me. And I was raised Catholic and I'd gone to a Catholic primary school and then I was at a Catholic high school. And I remember my English teacher going through the first draft of this um, of this piece that I'd written about it. And, and she was like, wow, you know, this is really creative writing here, you know, that you've just made up this story and and I said that's no story that happened last December and the look on her face she was just shocked that I would share that story Ugh. um at a Catholic school yeah that my and I was like I'm not ashamed of this yes. this is this is my uncle and I loved him and he loved his partner and HIV is not you know this is this is a disease this is not there is nothing to be ashamed about here and I and yeah, it just since since doing that and since the reaction that I got and I've just always stood proudly for for what I believe in and mm. the people that you love and the relationships that you have, they are so much more important than what anybody else thinks. Yes. And yeah, I've just always had this desire to <laughs> just say what I think and to be real because otherwise you end up just internalizing too much and feeling shame for something that should be celebrated. Yes. Um, we should be celebrating these choices that we're making. We should be celebrating your uncle's choosing, life. <laughs> yeah. My uncle's life. Yeah. Um, celebrating the choices that we make for our children. Um, the sacrifices that, that we make as parents for trying to go down these choices. You know, a lot of people will say, Oh, well, you can make that choice because you're privileged and mm-hmm. this and that or whatever. And I certainly, you know, am privileged in many ways. Um, you know, grew up in in you know a, a family who um, helped me get through university and um, and you know went. But 
but I've made so many choices in my life that have put me where I, where I am. And also we do make sacrifices. I, you know, I, I have a job that I, that I work out from home. I'm doing this blog at night time. Um, we're trying to find a way so that we can go down to one income and, and make sacrifices in that way. You know, mm-hmm. we, we're talking about moving to a small town, getting a smaller mortgage. Do we go down, you know, what are the things that we can do? And, and I yes. think so often that, People just think that these are easy choices to make, but mm-hmm. they're not necessarily easy choices to make. But if they're important to you, then then you can try to figure out a way to make them possible. Oh my gosh, so much yes. Like the values episode of this podcast. Yeah. I know we talked a lot about that. And talking about homeschooling, like for sure I hear, I, I get those comments and those responses often where if I share some really wonderful moment I'm having in our homeschool life with our kids, I'll get a comment that says, you know, not everyone can homeschool, you know, to yeah. which I respond like, okay, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but really like on this podcast, I know I've talked so much about like, yes, there is a privilege piece in the sense that I wasn't born, you know, in, as a female in, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, and I was like, and on and on and on. There is a privilege piece, but there's all there are there are also a great many things that I say no to, so that I can say yes to yeah this definitely. life that I'm and living. I, yeah, that privilege. I think I've heard Brené talk about it. Um, sometimes I find that silence in me, thinking, "Well, I shouldn't really talk about this because maybe I am luckier than." some other people or maybe I have created a situation um where I can do these things but then I think no but if if we don't stand up and say these things then and try to change things for others so that they can have have a path to be able to to make different choices then then who will yes um so I think it's important to yeah to live your whole truth Yeah, and try to move through these interactions with empathy. People vent negative judgment at our different choices when they experience that cognitive dissonance and feel threatened. So you might be saying, we choose to homeschool, but they are triggered and might be hearing, there may have been a better way to educate my child. And they can't tolerate that possibility, so they have to squash it. (laughs) Now, that's just one example, but my point is that it's not about you. It's about them. Hurt people hurt people. And when I remember that, I can stay in that space of empathy. And you talk about that empathy piece too, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to find some kind of common ground if you can. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then talking through it. Yeah. So if we have shifted our relationship with judgment and are living authentically and responding calmly and confidently, the last bit to cover is resilience. How can we increase our resiliency living in a society in which we are so often running counter to the established values? I, I think we've, we've covered some of it, you know, talking about um, what Susan David says about discomfort being the price of admission mm-hmm. to a meaningful life. So just re- first, firstly realizing that, um, that if it is feeling difficult, that's not because you're doing anything wrong. Right. <laughs> that's because it's, it's normal to, to feel that dealing with judgment on on a semi-regular basis is normal um so trying not to run away from that discomfort knowing that there is no magic answer to it um and also realizing that what we're doing what we're modeling for our kids um is is so important that it that it is a worthwhile process to go through and sometimes i think you know we're always going to be judged that that saying, you know, you can't please everyone, so mm-hmm. you might as well please yourself. <laughs> and um, thinking, well, I'm either going to be judged by this person um, who may be a permanent figure in my life or who may be a, a stranger or a friend, or I might be judged late now or later or in 20 years by my child for a choice that I made. Yeah. And the person who I am most responsible to is my child. Mm-hmm. So. I will always make decisions that are in his best interests that I can explain to him why I made those choices. So I would, I would rather disappoint a stranger or yeah. disappoint my own parents than disappoint my son. So it's just making the choice of whose judgment is more important to you. Mm, so much. Yes. Um, and then I think 
licking your wounds and running back to your tribe of people <laughs> who understand where you're coming from. Um, I found that really hard. Like you, in in day to day life, I don't have anybody who really parents the same way mm-hmm. that I do. Um, my sister is on the other side of the world, and and she makes similar choices to to what I'm making now. Mm. But that you know, that's certainly been one of the driving forces for me in starting Race Good. And I've got a Facebook group now that I think I started maybe a year ago, just to try to connect everybody and um, and people give each other support in there. And and you know, there are Facebook groups for for all different sorts of topics, obviously. Um, now that we've started down the homeschooling path, I've started to connect with more people in real life and we've got a couple of homeschooling groups that we go to and sort of compare stories and, you know, what, what's the silliest thing that somebody said to you this week? You know, how many times did people ask you, is it a school day? Why aren't you kids in school? What's going on? You know, what answers did you come up with? Were there any goodies, you know, to just go and have a laugh about it and, um, (laughs) Find find those people that understand you and um, and build you up so that you can go back out and face it again. Yes. Um, yeah, and I think just over time it gets easier. Um, you know, you prove yourself on one thing and and then you start to trust yourself that the next decision you're making is right. Mm, um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I one of the reasons why I write about sleep so much is that I think that that's really the first testing ground for parents to... For sure make decisions about how they're going to approach parenting and if they're mm-hmm. going to, you know, really lean into what their baby needs and trust their instincts and try to listen to those and drown out the white noise of society, drown out the yeah. judgments that come from, do you have a good baby and all this other rubbish. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and really choose your child. Um, because, you know, once you, I think there's sort of two different paths and you can switch paths obviously as you go along, but I think often if parents can be convinced to ignore their crying baby, they can easily be convinced to put a toddler in a timeout and yeah. easily be convinced to discipline and to punish and threaten and reward and do all these sorts of things and start to see their child as an adversary rather than as somebody who is actually on their team. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think just trying to find ways, trying to find external mentors, you know, like Brené Brown, um, mm-hmm. Dr. Shivali. She's she's amazing. I saw her in person. Uh, she came to Vancouver um, a couple of months ago and I saw her speak and she's just hilarious, so funny and so smart and so witty. And, um, yeah, seeing other people who have um, stepped out of the mainstream and their and their lives haven't fallen apart and their kids aren't in jail. <laughs> <laughs> like, it works out. Yes. Um, yeah, just making making baby steps, seeing that the choices you made around sleep, well, they worked out, and breastfeeding, that worked out, and yeah. EC, that worked out, and so yeah. school's going to work out. And, and they're um, not axe murderers, yeah. so. No, no. <laughs> and also just not putting too much not putting too much um, pressure on yourself for a decision, Mm -hmm. you know, like certainly with, um, you know, like something with, with um, schooling, you're deciding to do that now. That doesn't mean you're not going to change course in a year's time Mm -hmm. or in five years time or that life might change. It doesn't mean that you're committing to something for the next 20 years. Right. You're committing to it now. It's right for you now. Don't make decisions out of, don't make a decision that's not right for you now out of fear that it might not be right in the future. Yes. Because so many of those things never even happen. Yes. <laughs> I, when we first decided to homeschool my oldest, so many people would say, oh, so are you like, you're going to, are you going to homeschool forever? Like, is that your plan for high school? <laughs> say yeah I don't know <laughs> we make the best decision that's right for our kid today and next year or tomorrow we'll take in any new information that we find and, and yeah. that is basically our kids needs and decide what's best for them <laughs> absolutely you can only make the decision with information you got at the time exactly. right now exactly exactly and then and if you do that then you're going to have less regrets she's like yes I made the decision I could at the time Maybe I would have made a different decision if I had different information, but I didn't have that information. So I'm not going to have regrets. I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm not going to feel guilty. I'm not going to feel shame. Absolutely. And and just own it and go with it. Um, you can never have a crystal ball or see in the future exactly what's going to happen. But yeah, yeah you can trust your instincts and trust your child. And Yeah, all I can do is look to my child and their needs and gather 
you know, information and make the best decision I can today. Yeah. I think ultimately, yeah. since the judgment of others is not a threat to me, I'm never trying to convince people that my way is the right way. I know you mentioned that earlier. I don't need others to agree that these are the right choices for our family right now. We are the only ones on the inside and there are choices to make. I don't need anyone else's approval. I'm not seeking it. <laughs> and this makes me Teflon. <laughs> yeah. There was this great article that I'll link to in the show notes, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, about how yep. our problem today is that we give too many fucks about all the things when we should really just focus on giving a few big fucks about the things that really matter. <laughs> Absolutely. My husband sent me that article a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. We care because we want acceptance and belonging. And from within this insecurity, we can fall into the habit of parenting with our ego. But what's your priority? And this is what you mentioned earlier, your child or the lady in the store. This is energy you're giving away to people you don't care about that could be better spent on the people you do. If you're having a hard time turning down the volume on all the judgment to actually hear your intuition, try this exercise. What would you do if you were parenting on a deserted island? It's one of my favorite questions because it really helps you to escape all of the noise of perceived judgment and get to the heart of what your kid needs and what your intuition is telling you. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I just have the to take island. yes, and I just have to take a minute to touch on privilege, though, which I know we brought up a few minutes ago. Um, be, but because there are some people in some places and in some times when living your truth legitimately is a threat to you, and not just a threat to your ego, which is the case for most of us. Let's keep it real. And but in those cases, being sensitive to the judgment of others can mean the difference in your survival. So I just want to say that you don't owe anyone your truth. You are not in some sort of moral low ground if you have to put on a mask or say whatever you need to say to survive. And you are not lacking strength or resilience if you are abused or stripped of your rights. So when I say the judgment of others is not a threat to me, I recognize that it is a privilege to be able to say that. And as I see it, that privilege gives me even greater responsibility in paving the way. I mean, when a teacher told me I couldn't breastfeed on school campus, I articulated that it was a legally protected right and continued to nurse. And I took on the school district to fight to align the policy with the law because I could. As a mother of a trans kid, I'm also listening to this conversation through that lens. And I know it's not always safe for everyone to be fully authentic in all times and places, even though it should be. <laughs> so I just want to be a pain in the ass and add that tiny little caveat to this whole conversation that we're having about being authentic and standing in your truth and being, you know, not giving a shit about what other people think and, and all of that, which I fully believe. And I'm also not judging people for whom there are times and places when they don't have the privilege to stand in their light. Definitely, definitely. I think it's it, that's such an important point to make. I, um, when when we discovered that our son was highly sensitive, uh, I saw a counselor a couple of times just to to get an understanding of of how to how to deal with that, what we needed to do, and and since then I've realised I think I am highly sensitive too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, but me but too. We were talking. Yeah, we were talking about who to about, you know, telling family and friends and some of the reactions that we'd been getting and none of them were bad reactions. Like, how could you react badly to that? But some, from some people, we just felt like we weren't getting the support that we, that we were seeking. And she said, well, you don't need to, you, you have to choose who you trust your heart with mm. and you don't have to be vulnerable with everybody. Yes. You don't have to tell everybody the full truth. So when I say that, you know, 50% of people lie about bed sharing, um, sometimes I might be one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time I'm telling the truth. But sometimes if I'm just tired and exhausted or I just can't handle it again and I just don't want to have the conversation, then you don't have to have the conversation. Yes. Um, I think there's, yeah, it's definitely important to sometimes protect yourself 
um, when you need it. And you don't have to tell, you know, I'm not going to talk to my, my grandfather about full-term breastfeeding. <laughs> like it's just not appropriate. It's a, there's, there's no point. Um, yeah. So, um, well, and that's yeah, why, like, what my the number you know, I gave like three <laughs> possibilities for responding to judgment, and the first is ignore because they're like I said, you don't owe anyone your story, and there are gonna be, like, your therapist said, you want to choose people you are vulnerable with with intention. So, since I have the privilege to be authentic in virtually every space, I really I feel capable and, um, you know, prepared for that. And so I do that. But you, that doesn't mean that I'm vulnerable with everybody and in all, and in all spaces. And so some people, I know some clients I've worked with and some women who've reached out to me have said they feel like because there's so much judgment from family or their community, um, they feel like they don't they can't be vulnerable with these people who are constantly challenging them to which I help them like make those connections. Like you said, your sister, even though she's across the country or these Facebook groups, like places where it is safe for you to lay down your armor and be vulnerable because we all need the, the safe places to do that and the safe people to do that with. But in being authentic, that's how you connect with those people. Like you mentioned earlier, right? Like that's how you, that's how you get into that space of belonging is by being your authentic self. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's move into our Q and A. I posted in the Sage Parenting Tribe on Facebook that we were going to chat about judgment today and asked if anyone had any questions about it. Noelle asks, how do we raise children who judge less and stand proudly in the face of judgment? Uh, so for me, um, this partly comes back to one of the things we talked about at the start. So to teach about judging practices, but not judging the person necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so I know my son has got one of his friends just really struggles with sharing. And as, as a natural parent I'm like well it's completely normal not to share and yeah. we're not going to force sharing we take turns and all these sorts of things yeah. but um but you know my, my son's five now and um and can understand it and and he loves sharing he's saying you know my friend he he's being really mean he's mm -hmm. not sharing I'm like okay well he's not being mean <laughs> but he doesn't know how to share so you know how does you know how could we help him share you know, we could we could have him around and we could help teach him how to share or, you know, you could share your things and then maybe that might feel good for him and then maybe next time he'll want to share but let's look at the practice rather than at the person. Um, I think it's really important to try to make that distinction um, so that, yeah, and, and you know, the, the privilege piece as well, you know, bringing in the, um, the notion that, you know, some people are making certain choices because of the situation that they're in. Um, yeah. And if we were in a different situation, then we would have to make different choices. Um, so realizing that um, that circumstances affect affect our choices, and then standing proudly in the face of judgment, I think that's that's really when it just comes back to us that we need to be modeling what we want to see in our children. So st us standing in the face of judgment and um, showing showing how that's done and you know talking to them about it and talking about that um that the decisions that that we make for ourselves might be different to other people and you know even running through how we make decisions and how we make judgments about certain things and really giving them the ability to make their decisions as young as possible yeah. um so and you know having having faith in them that they will make the the right choices and yeah trusting them um not always hovering over them and and <laughs> letting them letting them take a few risks and uh yeah so i think just modeling it and and really making the distinction that there are uh there are there are practices and then and then there's the person behind it that we don't judge i love how you how you encouraged your child to question the meaning that he was assigning to that experience. Because that mm. is really where we as humans, adult humans especially, like this is true all across the lifespan, that's where we 
get in trouble is that we we have we use our own lens to interpret our experiences and often our interpretation is always our interpretation is not a, a reflection of objective reality it's it's just a reflection of the life experiences that we have had up to that point. And so that's a really, you know, I just posted this meme about, I'm wondering is one of my favorite ways to start a conversation with kids. And this is one of the, you know, 5 million ways that that question comes in handy for me is when I hear my kids assigning meaning to an experience and I want to encourage them to question it is <laughs> I might say something like, I'm wondering why else someone might have a hard time sharing um, and just sort of encourage them to dig underneath that assigned meaning a little bit. And then the other thing that you were talking about is is basically having that empathy piece, right? It, I'm sure you saw that update to the marshmallow um, study. So do you remember? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, like, yeah. like uh, many years ago, they did this study about delayed what is it, delayed reward or delayed gratification or whatever, delaying your... Gratification, yeah, I think. delayed gratification, yeah. where if you give kid, you set a marshmallow on the table and you tell a young child, um, if I'm going to leave the room, if I come back and this marshmallow is still here, you get two marshmallows. Um, and they, they looked at the results of this study. It was longitudinal, and they found that the kids were way more successful if they... Um, had chosen to wait for the second marshmallow. Well, they went back and did an update to this study and showed that if kids are growing up in an environment where they can't trust the adults around them and the resources are scarce, then they are far less likely to wait for that second marshmallow because they can't, they've learned that they can't trust that there will be a second marshmallow. Um, so it's yeah. sort of take this one now or possibly get none. Um, and they tested this by having the researcher present that same opportunity, but then come back and take all the marshmallows and say, like, oh, never mind, you know, the study is done, have a nice day. And then they then they would have them come back and ask the same question. So now here's a, here's a marshmallow. Do you want to eat this marshmallow? Or I'm going to leave, and when I come back, if it's still here, I'll give you a second one. Well, of course they ate the first of one marshmallow. Yeah, <laughs> right? I would too. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think me too. And so, and then when you look at the longitudinal, you know, results from that original study you need to go back and question like what those what that data you know the meaning that they assigned it what that data actually showed like it makes sense that children who are being raised in environments where the resources aren't scarce and they learn from a very young age that they can wholly trust their caregivers and the people who are providing the resources then yeah they're gonna have better outcomes in life so I think just that was kind of a tangent but I think that brings to calls to mind the empathy piece that I know you have talked about in your book and you've talked about in this conversation. Um, but my response to her, to her question, like role modeling, any longtime listeners out there should be yelling out <laughs> role modeling. If you are judging yourself from a place of self-love and grace and growth, that is the template you construct within your child's mind. If you are judging others from a place of empathy, learning, and justice, your children will do the same. So if you meet the judgment from others with clarity, contentment, and confidence, your children will inherit that recipe. And the flip side is also true. So if you want your kid to judge less and stand proudly in the face of judgment, then you have to role model that. And then the other piece is that we're striving to raise heartful human beings. Uh, remember that hurt people hurt people. They hurt themselves and they hurt others. So putting in the work with natural parenting and learning is an investment to that end. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an upfront investment, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it seems like more work at the start. <laughs> yes, but it's so So hopefully off. we'll pay out in the future. Yeah. Yes. I think one of the other things that, that you said um, when you were talking earlier about um, – um, when you're in the store and and West um, hurt himself, um, and you just you just observed what you had seen. Mm -hmm. I think that's I, I heard on another podcast a year or two ago um, that that's one of the most powerful and and I use it. It's just one of the most powerful parenting tools that I've got is to just yeah. say what I see, yeah. and and it can just take the judgment out of it. Yes. Um, I was uh, after I listened to that podcast, I was. 
I was doing too much. I was juggling too many balls. I think my husband was probably away and I was typing on the computer. I was trying to get an email off to my boss or something. And, and my son was yelling out to me and he was like, mom, can you see this? Can you see? I'm like, yeah, just in a second, in a second, in a second, come and see this come in a second. And then eventually he just came up and he just hit me on the leg. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd, I'd listened to this podcast the day before or something. And I was like, right, stop. <laughs> And normally I'd be like, hey, don't hit me. Like, what's Mm -hmm. going on? And I was like, no, I'll just say what I see. And I was like, I see a little boy who's been patiently trying to get my attention, a mum who is juggling far too much. Yeah. You've come and got my, you've escalated it to the next level to try to get my attention. And, of course, hitting is unacceptable. Um, But at the same point, at the same time, I'm just saying what I see and I just see that you just really wanted to show me this exciting toy or whatever you were showing me. Um, and I think, yeah, just saying what you see can, can take out some of that emotion out of it, that, that assumed emotion, you know, assuming that his friend is mean because he's not sharing, like just saying what you see. Well, I see a kid who's not sharing, um, or I, I, you know, and, and then trying to, to understand why. Yes. Um, Reflecting and validating. Like that's my language yeah. for it. I mean, when Wes was running around and hit his head and fallen, I could sort of hear the, the, the meaning assigned to it from a lot of other people that I grew up with who might say like, so you were, you were making bad choices in this store. It was too busy to be running and you yep. ran anyway. And now you're hurt. Like, <laughs> I mean, and also you should have been watching him. You shouldn't have been letting him run around. (laughs) So trying to strip away as much of that meaning as like a reaction, just strip away all of that and just, just say what you see. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Just like reflecting what actually happened and then trying to validate their feeling about it. Like you Mm. fell down and you hit the table on your way. It looks like that really hurts. Like those two things. Mm. Oh my God. If I could just put that in every parent's toolbox that if you don't know how to respond, just reflect and validate. Start there. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So a day in the life. Describe your favorite day this week and share with us why you loved it. Uh, it was it was a little bit more than a week ago. My son and I had had the day together ourselves, um, just the two of us and um, it was a nice sunny day. And so we um, got ready to go for a hike and we just um, packed the stuff in the car and headed up the Sea to Sky Highway. Actually, it was the day when I met the teacher in the gondola. Um, <laughs> so, but um, so it's about a 40 minute drive away and um, my son just loves listening to the Beatles. So mm, good he listens taste. to the Beatles the whole way up. Yeah, he loves Hey Jude and <laughs> um, Twist and Shout. And um, so we was bopping away in the car. Um, all the way and I packed we'd been reading he loves dinosaurs just so passionate about dinosaurs and so we packed a couple of his dinosaur books in in the bag and um went up the gondola up into this just beautiful location just near Squamish um up the road from us and we're up in the mountains and went for a little hike they've built a new um kids trail so there's all little rock climbing bits and um you know pretend eagles hiding in the in the forest and all sorts of things so he just loves this kids trail and then we get through that and then we get out on this other trail that I really love going on and you almost get to the end of the trail and then there's a sign that says the next part of the trail is more difficult and so, like, 95% of people turn around at that point and go back. And <laughs> we continue on, like, the extra 10 metres. <laughs> and I don't even know why they say it's more difficult. It's not more difficult. Like, it's just – so we always have this part to ourselves. And it's just this rocky outcrop. And then we just look out over the over the ocean. It's uh... beautiful view. And we just sat there and we had a couple of cookies and, um, and just read his dinosaur book and – then we continued our hike back and then came home and yeah, it was just, just fun and easy and yeah. Um, what a fantastic metaphor, right? Of like yeah. the society posting the sign saying like, this path is too, it's too hard. Don't, you yeah. don't want to take yeah. it back. And you're yeah. brave enough to take it anyway. And yeah. there's this amazing reward. Like that path yeah. gives you this breathtaking view. Big time. Oh, Big man, time. I love It's that. like, it's just there. It's, <laughs> you could even peek through and see the end of the trail. But yeah, yeah. Oh, so, my, yeah, definitely that. great metaphor. 
<laughs> well, let's take our deep dive. The show notes can be found for this episode at sageparenting.com backslash podcast 18, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. I realized as I was preparing for this episode that I, after in 17 episodes, I had never given you all... <laughs> the url to actually get the show notes so you know podcast learning curve all of these show notes can be found at sageparenting.com backslash podcast and then simply the number of the episode um so what are your favorite resources for people to dive deeper into this topic uh well some a number of the ones that we've already talked about so um you know looking up um Brené Brown's fa- uh, famous TED talk mm-hmm. on vulnerability, um, understanding that yeah, the difference between being yeah brave and courageous and and vulnerable and surrender and all those sorts of um, scary emotions that mm-hmm. um, help us deal with judgment better. Uh, definitely the Susan David TED talk and and you mentioned her book, The Emotional Agility um, piece. I have um, I have one blog post on my on my site that's about judgment i can send you the link to that and i talk a bit more about that in my book and um who else else can we add to this (laughs) well i will link to that article the subtle art of not giving a thought um and to your book of course and to that article that you recommended yeah, I'll send you the link to my Facebook group as well. Um, Fantastic. I did which not, is a whole bunch of people being honest. I did <laughs> so, not even know that you had a Facebook group, so I'm, ex- yeah, I'm excited yeah. about that. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's such a such a great group. Um, there, It's a closed group. You have to answer the questions, so just answer the three questions. They're super easy, and then um, a couple of the mums help me on the admin group, and then they'll uh, let you in straight away. Nice. All right, well, I think... We have covered every side and angle of the issue of judgment that I can possibly think of. I have been working with families for, oh my God, so many years. Um, and I know that this is an issue that so many people struggle with. So hopefully we have helped some people out there who um, could benefit from just shifting their relationship with judgment a little bit. That's my hope. And you have been so lovely to talk to. I know oh, thank scheduling you. this has been a bit tricky and I was not going to give up because I <laughs> love all of your work and I love all the things you say and I think you're a lovely human being and I am so happy that we get to share this conversation that quite frankly I feel like would have been fine if I just had it with you I would have felt awesome but I love that we get to record it and share it with other people so they get to listen in. me too me too awesome thank you thank you so much for having me on